Hello and welcome to my video on the memory topic, specifically focusing on the forgetting subtopic within memory and even more specifically focusing on interference, uh, the interference explanation of forgetting. Uh, there are two with retrieval failure being the other one and I'll obviously do a separate video for that. Um, so what you need to know, you need to know what causes forgetting, um, you need to know these two specific terms, retroactive and proactive uh, interference, uh, and you need to be able to evaluate these theories of interference. So looking at forgetting in general then, what, what do we consider forgetting? Well, you've probably got some sort of an understanding or have already discussed it. Um, whether this you're watching this video as revision or you're watching it as part of your learning on the memory topic, you would have probably already looked at the models of memory. And within the models of memory, forgetting does come up, but this is looking at it in, in a bit more detail. Um, so a definition of forgetting would be a loss of ability to recognise or recall information. That becomes important, um, so it's saying that... that the second part of that, the recall information part, it's not necessarily saying that when you forget something it's completely gone, but if you can't recall it at a particular time, so you're asked a question for example, this must have happened to you, you ask a question, you know you know the answer, but it, it's just not coming to you, known as a tip of the tongue phenomenon. Or you walk into a room to pick something up and you've completely forgot what you walked into the room for. So that actually counts uh, as forgetting as well. Um, generally, the, the, the initial theory of forgetting is it's through decay. So, uh, and this again harks back to the multi-store model. Decay would be maybe when in the short-term memory um, you've gone over the, the up to 30 second duration or you've, you've surpassed the nine uh, chunk capacity. Um, we would say the rest of the information decays, so it drops out of the memory system. That That's the historical uh, view of it, but that's fairly limited. It only really takes account of short-term memory. What about when things go into long-term? And the multi-store model would say that when things are in the long-term, they're always there. And we well know, as, as I've already just said, that actually things might be there, but you might not be able to recall it. So what's happening here? So that's where these other explanations of forgetting have come in. Uh, and obviously, as I say, we'll talk about interference now, um, but failure to recall, uh, failure to retrieve is, is also another explanation. So when we talk about interference then, what we're going to be talking about a bit more today, um, what is that? Well, the definition of interference is where maybe different bits of information are conflicting with one another, or where one memory is distorting the other so you've got two separate memories maybe competing and you're picking out the wrong bits of information that's what we're talking about with interference where where there are different memories but they are having an effect on one another resulting in incorrect recall or, or, or forgetting um, interference there are two types of interference. Um, one is called retroactive interference, and the other is called proactive interference. That's RI or PI. These are very, very commonly, quite ironically, forgotten, or, or at least confused. There is interference about these different types of interference, retroactive and proactive. The words you may have already heard about outside of psychology. So think of the word retroactive, retro being old, past, um, whereas proactive, think of the word proceed, going forward. And I think that's a good way to start remembering it and actually a good way to distinguish between the two. Um, so retroactive interference is when old memories are affected. So the start of the word, the suffix of the word is the the type of memory that's being affected. Retroactive, the old memory is being affected, and we'll see a, in a moment. Proactive is where new memories are being affected. So yeah, looking specifically at retroactive interference. So old memories, retro, are influenced by new information. So you've you've remembered information, um, you've, you've, you've had it there, it's been fine, and then some new information comes along and that conflicts with that. So, um, yeah, current attempts to learn something interfere with past learning. So an example of this might be, uh, so I've got a new psychology class, I've been teaching them for a couple of months, and then maybe one of my old students comes back from the, from the year before, and I confuse their name, I, I can't remember their name, and I call them the name of someone in my new class. 
that's retroactive interference. My old memory, my memory of my student from a year ago has been affected by my the new information that, that's most present. Uh, Miller and uh, Filzecker have done studies into this, or done a study into this, where participants were given a list of nonsense syllables to learn, so uh, short words, um, didn't really mean anything, and that they had to learn these words. And there were two different ways they had to learn it. Some participants just learned the word list and had to recall them, whereas other participants were given another task to do. So they were asked to describe a landscape, for example. And what they found was the participants that were asked to do something else to describe the landscape, their recall was worse. So that study would suggest that the retroactive interference is happening. The the old information, which the, the word list would be after they had looked at the landscape, is being affected by by that task, by by having to describe the landscape, um, and that was was seen as supporting evidence for the idea that retroactive interference um, would have an Im impact on forgetting. The second side of interference is proactive interference. Then, uh, and this is where. Past memories influence your ability to learn new information. So that example I gave before of my psychology class, this might be where maybe I've got a new class in September um, and um, I call one of my new students by the name of one of my old students. Um, so my past knowledge is having an effect on the new information. Worst consequences would be to call a new boyfriend or girlfriend your old boyfriend or girlfriend's name. So now you can just blame psychology and say, sorry, it's my proactive interference. Um, this has been tested again by Underwood. Um, they got participants to learn a word list, um, say 20 words, um, got them just to recall the list and there was about 70% um, recall. What they then did with another group, they got them to learn the same word list but before they got them to, wor to learn um, nine others or ten others. So it was the same word list they were being tested on, the very last one, um, which was the same one as, as the participants in the control condition had done, but before that they had to learn a load of others. And what they found was that participants were recalling words that were on the previous word lists um, rather than the one that they had just read. So what that suggests is that this proactive interference is happening. Old information, stuff that you've already learned, is having an effect on your ability to recall things that you've immediately seen or you're trying to learn at that time. Something which is thought to have an effect on both types of interference is similarity. So if the information you're trying to learn is similar to the old information um, or new information similar to old information or old inf <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Basically, if the information is similar, um, you find it more difficult to learn the words or learn the information. Um, so this was done by uh, two researchers, by the looks of it, who are Scottish. Um, and what they asked people to do is learn word lists. So for example, this isn't what they actually used in their study, but th this is an example. The word list was um, modes of transport, car, truck, tractor, moped, um, etc., bus. Uh, and then they got them to learn a separate word list and that word list they did it once where that word list was very similar so you might have had bus taxi motorbikes so that those those words are similar to that first word list and what they found was uh, an ac accuracy 12% recall accuracy um, when you ask them to recall list A after having re uh, after having read list B. So you, you find that similarity is having an effect on the accuracy of the recall. Whereas when they were asked to do another task, so it's still interference because the two bits of information are interfering with each other, um, but that task were was less similar. So they had one where it was nonsense syllables. Um, so that's less similar. It's still letters, so it's similar in that regard, but it's less similar because obviously they, they don't mean the same thing. Recall increased, so this time recall was 26%. They had it with numbers as well, and obviously numbers, while they're still recalling something, numbers are very different to letters, and so they're more dissimilar, and the recall increased again. So what you find here is that similarity does seem to have an effect on interference. So when you're trying to learn things that are 
you know one psychological theory and another those two things are, are quite easy to to um, confuse much like proactive and retroactive interference um, but when the things are different they, they might be easier so you're less likely maybe to get a, a psychological theory confused with something from geography or economics for example um, what this does do, it goes back to decay when I first mentioned forgetting. Decay was thought to be the reason for forgetting, where this sort of research actually backs up the idea that interference is more likely. If decay was the only reason, what you would find was it wouldn't matter what the words were, um, what was interfering with what, the, the length of time and the amount of information, that is accounted for by decay. But the fact that if inflation's similar, it's more likely there's more forgetting. That adds weight to the idea that interference is a better explanation for forgetting than, than decay alone. Uh, there was real world application for this theory as well. So lo lots of that research, in fact, all of that research, I think, has been lab studies. Um, we'll come back to that when we start evaluating these theories. So there was definitely room for real world application. Does this actually happen when it's not wordless and nonsense syllables or things like that? Badly and Hitch, uh, obviously famous for the working memory model, but they're back together here, back at it again, um, but actually testing interference. Um, and in this study, they focused on rugby players. Um, and what they did, they would, they, again, it was this, this difference between maybe interference and decay. They asked rugby players to recall teams that they had played against over a season. Now, a season is the same length for every rugby player. And so if decay was the primary reason for forgetting, you would expect a similar amount of recall um, from all of the rugby players because it's all been the same amount of time. What you actually found was different levels of uh, forgetting and the reason for this is because obviously different rugby players have played a different amount of games potentially against different teams due to injury due to um, illness due to uh, suspensions things like that not being available for games what you find is that some players will have played where others wouldn't general uh, squad rotation etc um, and what they yeah what they actually found was that the players that had played more, there was more forgetting there. So proportionally, they forgot more of the information than the players that had played less. This backs up the idea of interference. This backs up the idea that interference, that similar information, rugby clubs that you might have played against or not, are contaminating each other and having an, an impact on whether the recall um, is accurate or not. And so this theory it does a lot to, to add to the support of interference as an explanation for forgetting um, because it is not only is it real world, but it it, it's, it goes in the same direction. The results are very similar than, than what you found in the lab. Okay, and looking at evaluation for the interference theory of forgetting them. Well, as already mentioned, um, probably the biggest strength is that there is lots of research support for both proactive and retroactive interference um, lots of lab studies uh, so there's lots of high control you know things like nonsense syllables you need to think of why they may be used generally it's so that people start from a level playing field if you use actual words you know some people will know these words some people won't some people have more experience from them um, so there's lots of lab studies lots of high control so we've got good internal validity um, so we're, we're pretty sure that the the effects that we're seeing that the these findings that retroactive and proactive interference do have an effect on forgetting we, you know that that's happening certainly in the in the controlled lab experiments that then does raise a bit of a question is because you it could be seen as a bit of a weakness then actually because you may question the mundane realism you know uh, in real life do we have the, the this opportunity to learn in what will generally be quite a quiet environment quite a controlled environment very considered uh, bits of information that you're being requested to remember and recall well no life's a lot messier than that and, and there are lots of other interfering factors um, and so do the results actually give a true representation of what memory is like in the real world and, and you would question that um, 
Also, it doesn't really give us a, an insight into how we remember faces, for example. Um, you know, word lists are, are very different to the complex um, things that are going on when we're remembering faces. So you would you would question that. That's where the Badley and Hitch rugby player study came in to try and say, well, you know, we, maybe we've got a balance. And actually, any one study won't tell you a great deal about an area. But when you get a collection of studies that all seem to point in the same direction, direction that are using different methods then, then we've got quite strong evidence and, and and we're starting to get there in this case um, real world application as well so, so what does this mean what, what what are the implications for this research we know that when people see things they might it, confuse it with what they've seen before or or not remember what they've seen before because of the new information so you, you do need to consider that one one area may be advertising so if you look at commercials for things like perfumes or or cars or things like that they can be quite similar and actually if I were to just give you uh, an advert to look at without giving you the the manufacturer or the logo sometimes it's quite hard to, to pinpoint who the manufacturer actually is so that's something that's actually come out of this research and you know as advertisers and marketers they need to be aware of that and, and where and when they place their ads and and how much actual people are going to remember their products and remember the what what they're trying to to get across the final thing to note is that there will be great individual differences in interference some people no matter how much interferes with their memory they're going to remember it, they're going to remember memory really really, uh, really well um, you know, it doesn't matter how many, I know teachers who, it doesn't matter how many classes they have, they're always really, really good at pinpointing names to faces. Um, so how does this theory explain that? Well, it can't. There, there are great individual differences in our ability to remember and also in forgetting. Um, the working memory model might go some way to explain this. So some different people have different capacities uh, and um, capabilities within their, maybe their phonological loop, their visual spatial sketch pad, and that might have an impact on this interference. Um, and so that, that definitely needs to be taken account of. There are obviously many more evaluative points, but just picking out some of those for you. So there you go, a quick whistle-stop tour of the idea of interference as an explanation of forgetting. Um, and obviously the other explanation is retrieval failure. And we'll go on to that next.